Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, all right, so this is the second last lecture. We'll be still talking about, you know, reinforcement learning actor critic um, in some introduction to deep reinforcement learning. So Thursday is going to be the last lecture. After that, uh, I'll probably upload, um, you know, some kind of very brief introduction uh, summarization of the lecture, but it will be asynchronous. So I'll just upload the video sometime uh, for you to review the entire course, but uh, we won't have a formal lecture, but you know, so yeah, it was, overall, I think um, the lectures for reinforcement learning seems to be, I, I, it seem to be, uh, I think people are, uh, giving good feedbacks. And um, so, so, you know, I, I've, I guess I wanted to do a summarization of what we've covered so far. Uh, so uh, we started with, you know, the introduction, RL diagram, and we did talk about the derivation of Bellman equations. I think that's, you know, one of the most important concepts. Um, and so we started with temporal uh, difference methods, the TD methods, and it turns out that a lot of the uh, methods that we'll be learning later on are kind of related to TD methods. Um, so then, you know, we focus on uh, the more practical scenario when you have um, large state space or action space, you wanted to do function approximation uh, for value functions or even for policies. Um, so today we're going to learn something in the middle or something, a combination of the two, uh, which is so-called the actor critic methods. Um, but overall, hopefully what we've learned so far would serve as um, the foundation for learning, you know, why some of the deep reinforcement learning methods are doing um, you know, the things that they're doing. So we'll be talking more about that next lecture. But this lecture will be focusing on actor critic and some introduction to deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so actor critic is actually a meta algorithm. It's so-called a generalized policy iteration. We talked about policy iteration very briefly when we introduced um, you know, reinforcement learning. So it's alternating between a policy evaluation and a policy improvement step. Um, so, you know, you can see here, I have this blue box and the red box. Blue box is actor improvement, right? So this is the um, actor. And then the red box is the critic, the critic evaluation. So the actor aims at improving current pie uh, by getting the information output from a critic evaluation, usually a Q function evaluation. And then the critic, you know, by receiving a pie could evaluate, you know, the value of the pie or the Q of the pie, right? So that's, you know, how they are collab collaborating um, and essentially this, you know, we do this iteratively. That's why it's called a policy iteration. Uh, it's also called a generalized policy iteration. Um, so, you know, I said it's kind of a combination between the value-based methods and the policy-based methods. Um, so, you know, think about this. What, what's a value-based method? Basically, you estimate the value function, right? And, you know, policy is kind of implicit. We don't explicitly work on improving the policy. Um, you know, we often, for example, um, you know, we learned about Q learning. Uh, actually, I guess, you know, Salsa may, may be a better example. Salsa kind of implement an epsilon greedy uh, kind of algorithm, right? So uh, epsilon greedy policy. So, um, so that's value-based methods. But what about the policy-based methods? So policy-based methods essentially estimate the policy. Right. It is explicitly working on the policy. And, you know, uh, of course, there is no value function explicitly evolved. Right. So, you know, only the policy 
is kind of explicitly evolved and you know, we're working on improving it. So the actual critic is the combination of the two. It is estimating the policy, but it's also estimating the value function. So it is explicitly working on both. Um, so that's you know probably the reason why sometimes actor critic methods work very well. You can see the diagram on the right hand side here, right? So you can see the overlap between value based and policy based, and essentially it's the actor critic methods. So so you know we talked about this is a meta algorithm, right? So it's like a generalized policy situation, but it's a meta algorithm. So the question is, how do you implement a critic? Right? So the critic implementation basically estimates the value of the current policy. So it's a prediction problem, you know, if you wanted to uh, use the machine learning language um, terminology to describe it, it's really a prediction problem. So the actor, it's gonna use the Q values, right? Where do you get the Q values? The critic, right? So, so here is saying that the actor will have to use the Q values to choose actions. And therefore the critic evaluation is gonna do that. The critic must estimate the Q function. So um, here, I, I'm just listing a few different scenarios for smaller state space and the large state space. Again, not talking about a specific algorithm here, but I wanted to frame it as a um, meta algorithm, right? So for the critic, if you have small state space, then of course, you know, it is tabular. So you can use tabular TD methods, right? For example, we learn about salsa, we learn about Q learning, we learn about expected salsa and so on, right? Um, so, so, you know, what we've learned so far could be used in this critic when you have small state space. Okay, but also we learned about, you know, function approximation, right? So when you have large state space. So again, for large state space, you could again use what we've learned so far, like, you know, LSTD, for instance, to estimate the Q functions. So if you go, so if you go back to the next, uh, the previous lecture, you will notice that we learned about value-based methods and policy-based methods. So these value-based methods for function approximation could be used here. Okay, um, of course, I'm just using an example here. So let me see in the chat. State space is small, but action space can be large, so it can be invisible. Um, So, uh, so, so is this a question or what is this comment for? Oh, okay. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, uh, in the first case, we are considering small state spaces uh, and create some tabular form, like uh, have the critic in the tabular form, but the but in case the action space is large, it will be infeasible to create the table also, right? Yeah, then that's not a tabular case, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. so tabular case usually will say you, know, you can enumerate the state action pairs. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. That's a Thank good, you. That's a good question. Okay, so this is what I wanted to talk about in terms of the critic. Uh, okay, so... Now, you know, you might ask, how do I implement an actor? So after, um, so usually you can do some kind of grady improvement. Um, of course, you know, I, I believe there are other algorithms that are not always grady. So you can move the policy towards the grady policy underlying the Q function as made obtained from the critic. For example, if you have small state um, action spaces, then you know you can just have policy greedy with respect to the obtained Q uh, value, so arc max again uh, of the Q, right? So for large state action space, so because you have to do you know uh, function approximation, so your policy is parameterized. Uh, so then the greedy action is computed on the fly because you have a parameterized form. Therefore, you can you know, just compute the Grady policy based on the current estimation of the parameter. Okay. 
right? So this is the gradient improvement. Well, in terms of the policy gradient, so you know, as we learned before, it performed policy gradient directly on the performance surface, you know, some kind of uh, measure, J omega, right? So J omega sometimes could just be the value uh, underlying the chosen parameter policy class. So actually here, I wanted to introduce one important, um, I guess, you know, uh, modification to the policy gradient we've learned so far. Remember we learned about reinforce. Um, so in reinforce, right? So uh, what you do is, you know, this here I marked as blue. So you take the gradient of the uh, J omega, the objective function, right? So, and it turns out if you do reinforce, then you would actually calculate the gradient as the expectation of the gamma T, RT, RT is the return, gamma T is the T or um, power T of the uh, discount factor. And then the delta, you know, the gradient with respect to om logarithm of the pi, right? So this is what we learned about reinforce. And I kind of talked about why it is the logarithm of the gradient, uh, sorry, the, the gradient of the logarithm. So that's reinforced, but a modification of that is instead of using uh, you know, the return, what we can do is now in the actor critic, since we know the value we could use, since we, we have an estimation of the Q functions, we can replace the return by the Q function. Okay, so so in, so now you know the gradient estimation is not the gamma, you know, power t, rt, and the gradient of the logarithm pi, but instead is the gamma t q pi of stat. Okay, so this is a replacement of the return. Why? Before we don't have the you know. Uh, Q function because we are doing a policy gradient. And we said that policy gradient do not explicitly work with the Q function. But now in the actor critic scenario, we can because we have a critic that is evaluating the Q for us. So we can just replace the RT, the return, with the Q pi STAT. Okay. So um, I guess. You know, this is not very difficult to understand. Then more importantly, um, you know, many of you might have heard about the advantage function, but this is a very, very important method for reducing variance. You know, we know that the high variance is indeed a, you know, very serious problem in reinforcement learning. So one further modification to reinforce in this actor critic form is to have this so-called advantage function. So what is advantage function? Adv advantage function is the difference between the Q and the V. So see, here is the thing. So first of all, advantage function should be a function, uh, should be a function dependent on ST, the state, right? Because I'm going to, if a different state, the advantage function will be different. But more importantly, advantage function is a function of the action. So what is the action? So if no matter what the action is, the advantage function is saying, if I take that action, how much I can improve by taking that action, then following pi, you know, uh, so the difference between the value. I don't know, let me, say that again. So the advantage I could hope to improve my value function by taking action AT at state ST uh, compared with following pi at state ST. Does this make sense? Okay, yeah, so this, so you know, why is called advantage function? It is basically saying, I wanted to take action t instead of following pi, and I might get an improvement. Definitely advantage function can be negative, right? If you're taking the bad action, of course, you know, it, it could be worse than the value uh, following pi. But 
Anyway, so we are looking at an advantage function instead of a Q function. Why? You know, basically they're saying you can replace the Q with the A with the advantage function. Why? The reason is that this part, you know, so, you know, if you replace that advantage function, you would have an extra turn, which is the gamma T, um, V pi S T and um, gradient of the logarithm of pi, right? So the good thing about that is the expectation is actually zero. Therefore, optimizing, sorry, you know, having the update function using uh, the red turn. So I don't know if you can see my screen. So, have, you know, doing the update using the gradient estimated using the red turn is the same as uh, this term here. And because this term is actually zero in expectation. So this is why, you know, we use advantage function. Physically, it has a meaning. It's telling me, you know, how much improvement in terms of value I can expect by taking action A. However, mathematically, um, you know, you can prove that by using advantage function, you can reduce variance, and then you know the convert the the methods will be more robust. Okay. So this is you know a very important, I guess you know um, technique. Uh, that people use a lot in reinforcement learning using advantage function and using the fact that the expectation of the value function and the grade uh, and so you know using this fact can you see my uh, laser pointer using this fact that this expectation is zero uh, is 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 very important okay Yes, advantage function basically is a variance reduction trick. Okay. All right, so shall we continue? Okay. So this is the actor critic. Right, so actor critic really, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's really just something, um, a combination of the a combination of the value based and the policy based methods, you know, using both. So now, um, as promised, we're finally at the deep reinforcement learning. So what is deep reinforcement learning? I guess, you know, deep reinforcement learning really refers to using a neural network to approximate the value function or the policy or the model, right? So, you know, we talked a lot about value-based methods and policy-based methods. Um, we kind of, at the beginning of the reinforcement learning, introduction to reinforcement learning, we said, you know, we have this transition model, right? So, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking how, you know, we can, do dynamic programming when we know the model, but I kind of, you know, um, hinted that, you know, if you know the transition model, then everything becomes really simple. You can just solve dynamic programming and you will, solve, you will get the solution for reinforcement learning. So deep reinforcement learning is really just a special way of doing function approximation either a approximation of the value function or the policy or the model, right? When I say the model, it really means the transition model of the RL. And so, you know, now, you know, since you guys are familiar with, you know, deep learning, well, you know, instead of using simple function class, hypothesis class, you're using this compositions of nonlinear functions. So it's supposed to be rich, right? It's supposed to have very high expressive power. And indeed, you know, theoretic, theoretical work have shown, you know, uh, the universal approximator kind of theorem about neural nets, right? Um, so one thing, you know, 
deep reinforcement learning, although very powerful, but it may not give any interpretation or the estimate might be um, stuck at local optimal, you know, just like, you know, we would suffer similar um, problems in learning in traditional deep learning, right? So because we have this non-convexity of the optimization landscape, so indeed we don't know very well about how you can converge to a global optimal. But there were also a lot of work recently working on understanding the behavior of first order methods, second order methods on uh, deep learning, specific deep learning optimization landscape. Right, such as skip connection and things like that. But you know that's not the um, scope of the discussion for today. So I wanted to first introduce the value-based algorithms since I'm sure a lot of you have heard about deep Q networks. So first, let me just very, very briefly uh, review the deep neural networks. I mean, so this is just, you have, Neural network transforms input actor, the input vector X uh, into an output Y. And so you have uh, W0 X transpose. Uh, okay. So, you know, you have the input, you have a linear transformation, you have a uh, like uh, shift term. And then you have a nonlinear transformation, so-called activation function, right? Uh, ReLU function, hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, and so on. Group sort and these kind of more advanced activation functions. So once you have that, then you go through another linear transformation, have a shift term, and then another uh, activation nonlinear transformation. So you do that composition again and again. So the number of times you do that is the depth of the neural network. And then finally, you will get the output. Okay, so the output is also a vector. The input is in a vector. Usually input is in a very high dimensional space and output usually is in a smaller dimensional space. Okay, so this is just a very brief, I guess, recap of deep neural networks. So essentially, you know, for example, if you think about regression problems, usually you would have wanted to reach, you know, minimize reconstruction error um, or kind of like, um, uh, so, uh, you know, some kind of, I guess, it doesn't have to be this form. It doesn't have to be like, you know, uh, the L2 norm of the differences between the vectors. It could be other forms, but I'm just using an example here. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about classification, then the most popular loss function is the cross entropy loss, as you know, we might have uh, all be familiar with. So one important thing is, you know, in deep neural networks, uh, there are kind of weight sharing Right. So, so for example, in recurrent neural network RNNs, you have the weight shared between time steps. Um, and you also have the weight shared in convolutional neural network, which is the more popular uh, kind of neural networks used in, uh, you know, kind of images or language models or video models and so on. Okay, so now finally, you know, uh, we're here at the Q networks. So Q networks are essentially a function approximation of the Q function. So it's using a neural network, but you can imagine two ways of designing Q networks. So here on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side. Left-hand side is the Q network take an input S and also an A. So it's take an input state an action, so you know, state and action might have been mapped into vectors in a you know d-dimensional space. Then you produce the QSA. So this is the value conditioned on S and A. Right? So that's one way of designing Q networks. The other way of designing Q networks, which is actually the more popular one especially you know, popularly used in Atari games and so on. So it's this 
on the right hand side. So indeed your input is not as a pair, but only the state. So it's a state, rep, you know, vector representation of the state. Um, it could be an image, right? It could be a video, it could be, you know, um, it could be just like, you know, uh, discrete state also, right? So, so then you go through a neural network, but the output is different. It's not the Q values itself, but it's a vector of Q values. So the, the, each entry is corresponding to a different action. So you can imagine this is for finite action space, right? So you can see, so the first entry corresponding to the Q value corresponding to action one, second entry action two and so on, right? So all of these Q values are corresponding to the specific S that you input to the neural network, okay? So this is just a description of the Q network. And more specifically, um, here is an example of the deep Q learning, so called deep QM network. So you have the last four frames of the gameplay as the input, okay? And then you go through a CNN, right? So you have like eight, eight, eight by eight by four filter strike four. And then you have like four by four by 16 filter strike two. And then you go through a fully connected neural network, actually, you know, uh, second. So, so you have two layers of fully connected network. Then the output is corresponding to the vector of the Q values, each entry corresponding to one action uh, in your action space. Okay. So this is a, um, I, I believe this is, you know, a popular uh, Q, deep Q network used in Atari game. Okay, so now uh, with this deep Q network, so you know you would ask me how do I do train? Uh, how do I do training? Right. So for a neural network, you know you choose a architecture. Um, now, so it really is a matter of choosing a loss function, right? So a naive loss function is actually this so-called MSVE. We've seen that before. So it's you know it's like a, a TD error. Right, so think about the TD era. You have the R, which is the one step uh, reward, plus the gamma of the max Q, uh, S prime, A prime, theta. So this is very much like a Q learning, essentially. So it's basically mimicking the Q learning objective, right? Uh, although Q learning was an iterative algorithm based on TD era, here is like, using this T error squared as a objective function and do back propagation. Um, so, so, he, um, so, you know, first, let me see. So this is the MSVE, okay? So you can see I have theta here. Theta now are the parameters of this deep Q network. Okay, so now I can also write it as L I theta I, just so, you know, this is my I step. Right, so I can write this y as you know this part as my y i, right? So this is kind of like my target, uh, and then this is something that's going through through my network. Okay, so if you look at this form, this is very much like what you're familiar with a uh, regression problem using a deep neural network, right? So you have the target, and you have the input. And you're finally getting the outputs through the uh, of, of the network. You wanted to minimize the reconstruction error, uh, and of course, you take an expectation over all the data examples you're looking. But one thing interesting about this is like the data examples are no longer IID; they're actually from a uh, you know MDP, so the trajectories are correlated with each other. Okay, so. As I said here, you know, uh, this yi can be thought of as this guy here, okay? So now you, what do you do? You just take gradient, normal, you know, normal thing that you will do for learning, uh, for deep learning. So you take a gradient, you get this form, and essentially this is how, you know, deep Q networks doing, okay? So is there any problem related to it, right? 
right? First of all, uh, you know, of course, I wanted to mention that Q learning algorithm is basically a Q learning algorithm, but the thing is that Q function estimate is actually a neural network. But the problem with this is the algorithm actually provides a biased estimate. And more importantly, this algorithm could diverge because the states are actually correlated and the targets are non-stationary. Okay. So this is really problematic. So to solve these problem, I think the, you know, the most important contribution of this deep Q network paper was to provide two key mechanisms to solve these problems. One is so-called the experience replay. So what is it? So it, may, it might be something that's really heuristic at first sight, but it has a principle uh, consideration behind it, right? So if you store, so what is the experience replay? If you store the SARS prime, so this um, tuple, uh, in the replay buffer, okay? So you do that, and then you randomly sample instances from the buffer. Now you can see, instead of using, you know, my SA and my next step, S prime and A prime, I'm actually, you know, storing things in a replay buffer and do random sampling. Therefore, I can break the correlations in the data. Okay, so that's a very important trick that is used in reinforcement learning. And essentially, I, I can imagine this being applied to many other situations where you know, data is correlated. Okay, so more specifically, in order to deal with the correlated states, the agent builds a data set of experience and then makes random samples from the data set. Okay. And in order to deal with non-stationary targets, actually the agent fixes the parameter and then with some frequency updates. Uh, so, so what does this mean? This just means a target network. So the parameters of the target network are updated only periodically like I said in the previous slide. Oh, what happened? Um, here, so in order to deal with the non-station uh, NARI targets, so they choose to update this network periodically. So, what this means is that, um, so, so the parameters of the target network is only updated periodically and held fixed in between to reduce the correlations between action values Q and the target, which is R plus gamma maximal A prime Q S prime A prime. Okay, so basically these are the two key mechanisms for uh, deep Q networks. It is really a Q learning using a deep neural network, but because of these difficulties or challenges, um, the authors have proposed two mechanisms to deal with it. Experience replay, I think it's really useful for other situations as well, and the target network. I, I also think that this trick could be used in general deep learning methods, uh, you know, beyond reinforcement learning. Okay. So if there is no, is there any questions? If no, I'll talk about the extensions of deep uh, Q networks. Can I explain experience with play? Uh, you mean it again? Okay. Um, so you store, so is there any specific question? Um, nothing in specific, but it's like, um, 
so while training one input sample will be one experience or um like because because each data sample is not iid so uh, i mean i am not able to understand how uh, how replay i mean is done right so you know you wanted to use examples to minimize so how do you estimate the function value of your objective right so you use examples um and the way that you're using samples are not based on trajectory but based on a replay buffer and randomly sample from that replay buffer in q learning okay. in q learning you would follow the trajectory right you follow your implemented policy and you are uh, collecting you know this epsilon grady policy you know actions and you know rewards and transition to another state you're collecting those based on the order that they appear right so based on the order of the epsilon grady policy that you're implementing here you might also be implementing something similar but you do not collect samples based on the order of how you observe your triples uh, sorry this is tuples so instead you would store them in a buffer and then do random sampling so therefore uh, yeah each one's you know so, so there is a high probability that you won't collect the examples in the way that they come uh, in the order that they come okay i got it thank you yeah sure um right so i guess is this clear okay all right so let's see the extensions to deep q networks so one uh extension of the deep q network other than doing these two tricks right experience for plan and target network uh, updating it periodically so this is the uh, first extension of the DeepQ network, which is the prioritized replay. So instead of, so, you know, just like what um, um, Akhilasha, sorry, uh, let me not pronounce your name incorrectly. Just like what you asked earlier, um, you know, because you have the experience replay, you're sampling from the buffer. But now instead of doing a random sampling with uniform weights, um, we wanted to do something with kind of some priority. What priority would make sense, right? So this prioritized replay is suggesting that you sample the examples in the replay buffer um, you know, with a importance weight that is proportional to the TD error. So what does this mean? So this basically means that if the TD error is large, so that means I haven't learned a lot in those state and action, right? Because my values for my value estimation for that state and action is just very bad. It's not accurate, right? Because you know if TD when other TD error is close to zero, then we've converged to some kind of optima or either local or, op or global but some kind of optima but here if the td error is large then that means we still need to do a lot of work in estimating the state of the action values so it makes a lot of sense to sample the data that has a higher td error with higher probability Okay, so then the importance weight is really just something that's so the design is to have the importance weight of sampling proportional to the TD error. And that's a very simple idea, but it worked very well, although I don't have, you know, the, I guess I didn't put the results here, but so you can take a look at the paper. Um, it, indeed, it can achieve some kind of improvement. Okay. So this is one extension of the DeepQ network. Any questions so far? Okay. Now I'll go to the next one. 
So the next one is the double DQN. So the double DQN, also proposed in 2015, is to remove this upward bias caused by the maximum of the Q S prime A prime theta uh, minus. So the theta minus is causing some kind of bias. The idea is to produce two Q networks before we only have one Q network. Now you can have two Q networks is, you know, one is the current Q network, the other is the older Q network. So it's like a delayed copy of the current Q network. Um, so in the current Q network, you're going to use that for selecting actions, right? So because you know you wanted to do, um, you wanted to improve uh, the Q value based on, you wanted to improve your policy, you know, based on the current estimation of the Q. So you wanted to use the current Q network, which is parameterized by theta, to select the action to improve your policy. However, um, you're not going to use the current network to evaluate these actions. What you do is you're going to use the older network, which is theta minus uh, to evaluate actions. So you can see this. So the objective function actually becomes this one. So one thing you notice is that, so here you have this Q S prime A prime, you know, theta. So this is still theta. And also this one is still theta. However, uh, you have this Q of S A and theta minus, right? So this is Q S prime A theta. Let me just say Q star because this is arc max. So it's Q prime star kind of. So, however, you are going to use a older Q network to evaluate the action A prime star, okay? So this way you will break the kind of bias caused by this maximum of this guy here. Does this make sense? So, so by using two Q networks, you know, you, you first use this, whatever uh, I, I used, you know, I uh, marked with red. So this Q network parameterized by theta is going to use for select action, right? So this is selecting the action is arg max of this Q, but in evaluating it and then evaluating your TD error and essentially your objective, you're going to use this guy here with parameterized by theta minus. Okay. So this again seems to be a simple trick, but it solved the problem of, you know, it basically is able to remove, remove the upward bias caused by this uh, action selection term using. Uh, the same network, right? <laughs> Which is, you know, if you, before we're using the theta, but now you're using theta minus. Is this fine? David is smiling. <laughs> Do you that's an up arrow. Joy asks a question and I am seconding that question. We're a little confused by upward bias. Oh, can you explain upward bias? Oh, okay. Yeah, so I didn't see that. Okay. I thought that 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 was the question of explain uh, experience replay. Okay, so let me let me see. So let's go back. Yeah, so remember um, in the second, you know, mechanism we, for deep Q learning. So this is the one, okay. Let me circle it. Let me put a box on it. Can you see that? So here, 
what we're doing is our objective function, you know, in order to break the correlation, uh, we say, instead of using theta, we're going to use theta minus. And this theta minus, so basically you're using theta minus for selection of the action, right? Because, you know, arg, so it's not arg max, but max of the Q, S prime, A prime, theta minus, this is how you're selecting the action. What is wrong here? You're using the one that is updated periodically, so there should be a delay in your estimation. It might be some kind of old estimation, right? We did this only because we wanted to break the correlation between the data. So there should be a bias because the theta minus is not the current estimation theta. Okay, so now if you see what we are doing here, right? So the prioritized replay here, you can also notice that this is a theta minus, not theta. So now if you see, oh, sorry, here, right? So if you see this slide, uh, you can see, you know, instead of, um, so, so the way that I'm selecting, so before it was just like, um, how should I say? Yeah, so before it was, so let me put it this way. It was M S V E equals R plus gamma and max A prime Q S prime A prime theta minus minus Q S A theta, right? Can you see that? Uh, am I doing something wrong? Uh, I cannot write. So I, I don't I don't have space for the squared, um, but just pretend that I have a squared there. Okay. So this is what we were using before. But now in this double VQN, can you see the difference? Yeah, what is the difference here? Right. So before you are choosing the action based on theta minus, but now you're not doing that. You're still choosing the action using the theta, but only when you are evaluating it, you're using theta minus. Do you see? Uh, so I think Joy is fine with it. David, do you, um, uh, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I see the difference. Uh, yeah, so the difference is really like, you know, before you were using theta minus for both the selection of the action and the evaluation. But now you wanted to not use theta minus to select action. You wanted to use the theta to select action and you do want to use theta minus to do the evaluation. Again, so, I have to say this is very empirical kind of uh, trick. Okay, so yet there is another extension that I wanted to discuss, which is the dueling Q network. So dueling Q network is just another, again, yet another way of doing the extension through an empirical uh, kind of technique, uh, which is to combine two strings to produce Q function. So, um, so one is to use the state values, the other is to use advantage function. Actually, in next slide, I'll show you some kind of motivation why we do this. So this way, then the network learns the state values for which actions have no effect. Also, the dueling architecture can more quickly identify correct action in the case of redundancy. So you can see this example here. Actually, on the left-hand side, you'll see this so-called traditional deep Q network and the dueling Q network, deep Q network. So the, the upper one, 
here is the traditional one, and this is the drilling one. The traditional one is using the so see the so the traditional one was you only have like the Q network, but the dueling one is combining two strings to produce the Q network. One is for state value and the other is for advantage function. So then, so the example is showing here that they have, you know, you can see this is a value and this is advantage. So what they were saying is the value stream learns to pay attention to the road Whereas the advantage stream learns to pay attention only when there are cars immediately in front. So based on this kind of observation, they say, you know, can we combine both for the learning? Therefore, you have two streams, like we're saying here, you would have two streams to produce the Q function. Although actually I'm not, really understanding the principle of this other than this empirical observation they see in this specific game design or you know game design of rl agent okay i, I don't know if any of you are working on this so you might provide some more insight about it i have to admit that i'm not my research is not on like, you know, deep Q, uh, deep RL. Any comments on it? Is this model like multitask? Um, I don't think so. I think this is more like, you know, combining. I think it's a specific design of the, how to say this. So, you know, I don't think it's multi-tasks. I don't see like multiple tasks involved here, but I think it's kind of like, Yeah, it's, it's like combining input, I think. So because before your input is always like the state values, but now you have advantage function. Yeah, I don't think it's related to multitask. Okay. All these deep RL papers are extremely hard to reproduce. <laughs> well, I, I think deep learning papers also need some kind of, not deep RL also, even just deep learning papers, we need to set up you know, higher bars for ensuring reproducibility, right? So a lot of papers, I understand that learning experiment, you know, running these experiments will require a lot of time. So a lot of papers do not have error bars, do not have confidence intervals. Therefore, due to the randomness of the algorithm, um, it's pretty hard to reproduce, I agree. I haven't personally worked on deep RL algorithms. The only algorithm I worked on is a poisoning RL algorithm, which is using a deep neural network, but I guess there isn't a lot of previous work on that. Um, so yeah, I guess Michael's experience is that they're very hard to reproduce. Can, what can we do, right? I guess we have to write in our, when we write those papers, we should you know, make sure that we run multiple um, runs with random Cs and report the confidence interval. Right, so hopefully, uh, and we should also, uh, if possible, uh, open source your code. Um, you know, before you upload it, code, make sure it runs. Um, you set up the environment uh, using Docker, this kind of um, container, to make sure that the running is easy 
to follow. So Kyle is saying there are some GitHubs that implement a lot of BBPRO networks. Uh, yeah, I believe so. So, so, so Michael, you know, I guess I do think that. Yeah, I'm not sure if those paper, if these GitHub repositories would help, uh, you know, getting more confident results about this deep learning algorithm. Open AI baseline. Cool, good to know. So I can either have a, this, we can either have a discussion or we can continue to the next set of slides. What do we, what, what should we do today? We do have a few more minutes. Maybe let me just very briefly introduce what I'll be doing for next lecture. So I will, um, I will talk about some policy gradient algorithms in deep reinforcement learning. You know, I'll talk about uh, advantage actor critic A2C and asynchronous advantage actor critic A3C. Um, DDP, DDPG, and TRPO. But unfortunately, I won't have a lot of time to talking about the details, especially for trust region policy optimization. It has a very nice theoretical guarantee. Um, I do have some slides, but I don't, I don't plan to cover these theoretical guarantees here. I could try to share them in the slide deck. Um, afterwards, we'll also talk about PPO. So these are the examples of the policy-based deep reinforcement learning methods. Um, and then, you know, we'll talk about on policy and off policy, TRPO, PPO, A3C are all on policy and DQN, DDPG are off policy. And then I'll use one more slide to talk about model-based methods. I'll just introduce why to do model-based methods and you know what's the basic approach of doing model-based methods uh, could save some kind of samples and then um, i'll do a brief summary of the deep reinforcement learning right so model free methods and model-based methods and then lastly um, i'll talk about on policy and off policy uh, clarify some confusions people might have so that's everything I plan to do for next slide, uh, next lecture. Okay. So maybe let's stop here today, I think. Um, so as I said at the beginning of the today's lecture, uh, we will finish our lectures next uh, this Thursday, and then I will upload a short summary of the entire course. You know, you don't have to be here. Um, I will do that asynchronously. So I'll just upload the video. I just record it. Um, and then, you know, you guys will have the uh, week off to work on your presentation. Okay. All right. So if there is more questions, feel free to uh, reach out through email or through Piazza. All right. Thanks, everyone.